round beam of light working to make the world a better place and a close friend of mine, Krishita Begum, thank you so much for being here. Yeah, I'm excited to be part of this. Could you share, like backing up just a little bit, yeah. you said you got into like the trainings that yeah. you were doing in the community and like your personal story is one that is mm -hmm. really intense in a lot of ways and can you just talk a little bit about how your own life experiences have brought you to where you are today yeah I'm happy to uh, try and see where I should start I will just say that uh, a lot of people come to this country you know thinking that this is the land of opportunities and it makes all of your dreams come true and unfortunately for um, my situation and I can only speak of myself um, you know, my family was very poor. Didn't My parents didn't have an education. We were from a village, did not have, um, we had a place to live, we had a roof over our head, but just the basic needs of going to get an education, mm -hmm. to have food, to um, have hot food, you know? So those are things throughout my childhood, but we were poor and happy. Like we didn't know anything different, mm -hmm. you know? And so in the late 80s, when a gentleman came to America, a white, middle-aged, uh, educated gentleman that came to my particular village, and of course, we're not used to seeing white people, yeah. so it's like, it's like a form of something dropped from the sky, you know? Yeah. And he built this relationship with my parents and built them a new house, got them all this land. Um, we had food, we had another house. It was just like this dream come true. And, um, and he built this relationship with my parents, with the village, um, you know, helped build a mosque. He prayed five times a day, could speak our language and eight other languages. And everybody worshiped him, you know? And so when he came and asked my parents, um, can, you know, they, he wanted to take us to America, mm -hmm. uh, land of opportunities where money falls from trees, you know, and mm -hmm. the roads are paved of gold. Like there could be no wrong there. And my parents were really hesitant. My father, my mom, they were hesitant. Uh, Did he want to take the whole family? Or? He wanted to take the children. The children, yeah. To, to, because my father wasn't able to provide yeah. Uh, he was a fisherman. He didn't have an education. My mom stayed home. And we were literally one of the poorest families in the village. Yeah. And so when this man came, it was like we were no longer the poorest. And like when he wanted to take us and give us an education, it all sounds good, right? Yeah. And uh, my parents were hesitant and the village was like, why would you not take this opportunity? Yeah. Like, you're never going to get this kind of opportunity to send your kids in America. This was, you know, 87, 88, 89, long time ago, right? Yeah. And because the shame and the conversation that was happening in the village, like, why wouldn't he send the kids? I think that pressure forced my father to make the decision yeah. to send us here. And so... You know, so we, there was a whole grooming process that went yeah. into that. And so when I talk about my story, as you will hear a little bit more, that there are so many commonalities of how trafficking, how exploitation, how poor and vulnerable people are taken advantage of and not thought of like we should, you know, in this community and in just around the world, how we're perceived to be less than. And so... My parents finally said, okay, you know, we're going to go to America. And um, I just remember some very, like, crazy things that I didn't think about, just, like, stuff that was told to me when we were coming to this country that, you know, we're black. Like, we're, mm -hmm. we're different. And people in America don't make eye contact with them, don't look at them, you know, because we they don't like us. I mean, it was really weird. So yeah. we, when we came to the airports, when we went anywhere, we looked down. We did not look up at anybody, especially yeah. if they were white. And so that started at a very young, you know, just being programmed of the otherness. So we came to this country and we were brought to Oakville, Washington. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure Dang. people don't know where Oakville, Washington is. It's a very rural community. It's like Chehalis and Centralia, kind of in the 
in, in between those areas. Mm -hmm. um, we were brought to Oakville, Washington, and we were enslaved on a 64-acre farm. And uh, there was nine of us, and there was two bedrooms, and the whole intention behind be bringing us here was never to go to school. Yeah. Was never to... Um, to live out that opportunity in promised land here. Yeah. If, instead, we were enslaved in a 64-acre farm, and we were forced to work pretty much sun up to sundown. Uh, we were starved often. We were raped and abused and exploited, trafficked within uh, folks that he knew mm -hmm. within his circle. And... Um, we did not ever think that the nine of us, and they're all age range of like four to like 17. Yeah. Nine of us. But so it's like, you, how in the world follow? did we come through the airports? Yeah. Nine people with yeah. one white man and yeah. nobody ever questioned yeah. that this is very off. Yeah. And we're all looking down. You know, those are, there was a lot of red flags. Yeah. That was back then, that still continues to this day, and that's part of how you'll understand how I do the trainings that I do. Um, yeah, so we were brought here into, it was just torturous, it was hell living there. Um, how old were you during that time? Like, where did you fall in the age range? Um, eight, nine, yeah. ten. Yeah. And I had, and so, you know, it was just, it just seemed impossible, but here's, here's to, you know, I don't really need to get into graphics, but it was just a very, we just didn't think we were ever going to leave. Like we thought one by one we would die. And our, some of my siblings did try to escape and he did things like there was a big metal gate that would make a noise that was screech and it had this program that like if we ever tried to leave that screeching those sounds are, is what is going to alarm the police or the yeah. authorities or we could get shot we could get killed we could get deported we could bring shame to the family right, right. and i had the most wonderful amazing 14 year old cousin well i should actually i'm sorry she was like two years younger than me mm -hmm. older than me so she was about 13, mm -hmm. 14, um, and she, she did the most selfless act in the whole world that I've never met anybody like her, but she was always full of life, full of joy, and she decided and told us two weeks before, she was like, I'm going to take my life, I'm going to end my life in hopes that this will free all of us, and her name was Runia Ghazi. And um, that's why the Soul Cafe is also part of, named after her Soul Cafe. Yeah. And um, when she told us that, we're like, yeah, whatever. We didn't believe her. And so, but she did. She committed suicide. Um, and on that farm, like, we herded cows, sheep, lamb, worked from sunup to sundown in these conditions without hot water, without, like, really living conditions of nine people in a two-bedroom house. Yeah. Um, and so she, it was, so part of, I'm sorry, I'm going to back up. So part of what we did on that farm was to do agriculture work, to mm -hmm. do, you know, there was sex trafficking, labor trafficking all within, um, that farm that was happening. But the whole intention for him was to use us as slaves to work on that 64 acre farm to herd cows, sheep, lambs, and things like that. Yeah. So he could make profit out of our labor out in Seattle selling the meat and things like that. He also had another job, you know, worked for the government doing contracting work. Um, and that's how he ended up going to Bangladesh was because he worked for the World Bank. Uh -huh. so, so my 14 year old cousin commits suicide and we are terrified. We don't know, we know what's gonna happen. We run to the nearest uh, house uh, because we were very isolated and he come this this person comes and like he saw the distraught in the kids he came called the authorities and the authorities came and we thought like for sure because all the adults were gone doing the delivery up in seattle yeah and so at this point the kids are there just me and my brother and another cousin and we get the neighbor comes and the police everybody comes it was like red white and blue flashing everywhere they take her away, and there was a particular sheriff, a retired sheriff now, his name's Lane Yeomans. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. Um, And I was just like this. He still remembers I was just like this. I was just like praying that he would just like do something and we could just leave, you know? And he came and and, um, he came and then everybody was gone and we were back to that life again. And this particular... They just sh- like took her body and then just... And know, they were trying to figure out like this is a bizarre suicide case. Like, you know, <laughs> they didn't know. They couldn't... Yeah. They're, you know, there's three brown children. They're there. Right. One person committed suicide. We're all dark skin. Right. So what happened was part of my thing about what I do is like these different experiences that I've had. This particular sheriff who came would come back two weeks later, Meg, literally Mm -hmm. come back two weeks later because he felt like something was not sitting in his gut right. Something felt off and he acted on it. He convinced, excuse me, he convinced his boss, let's go remove the children. And then from there, we met another um, domestic violence shelter in Grace Harbor. The director took us in quit her job there, took us in, realized that there was severe trauma with, you know, um, with the kids. And then they're trying to investigate, like, wait a minute, this guy is this guy. He's got PhD from the University of Washington. He's yeah. this, he's this, he's that. Like, this doesn't like, add up. Does he even have these kids? Yeah, it just it. didn't add up, right? And so, um, so we ended up living, we ended up going living with the sheriff for two weeks because there was like no shelters. Yeah. Nobody knew where to go. We didn't yeah. speak English, read or write or anything, but we lived there. Then we, then the director took us in and she realized that there was something really wrong. And that kind of led to me going to the children's hospital. They found that there was definitely a lot of injuries. Yeah. Um, and then that caused to go to court. But here's the thing. Uh, We couldn't read, write, and speak English. I was the only one that went to court, and he was sitting right in front of me, and I was supposed to show with the stuffed animal what happened. Yeah. (laughs) And it was just so painful. Yeah. And um, And you had, like, He got a lawyer. Yeah. I mean, uh, yeah. So then from this whole situation, before I even got to court, they were trying to figure out, like, are we, you know, we weren't weren't legitimately here. We were the deporting process. All of that was all happening. But we were in the newspaper. It made all this newspaper in the early 90s, late 80s uh, about this family. And this is what's unraveled. And some couple in Grace Harbor read about us in the newspaper and said, hey, we're in our 30s. We are a chemical engineer and an English teacher. We can donate our weekends to teach the kids how to read, write, you know. And at that time, I had an eye injury that needed to get, you know, surgery and things like that. So they raised up enough money. But again, here are these two people who have an education, who are very well known in their community. They're very involved. I just happen to be blessed to that they read the newspaper and said, what can we do? And sometimes that kindness is just, what can I do? This is the resources that I have. What can I do with it? You know? So that's how I got involved with them. And then they did a whole um, march at the Capitol. And people were really like, it was really huge public. Like, hey, but the focus was on me, not the real story of like what else was happening with the rest of my family. So anyway, so I ended up getting sent back, came back and... um, Sent back to Bangladesh. To Bangladesh, my different family. And then because they use their privilege and power and resources, it was enough to get the governor involved. At the time, Booth Gardner, rest his soul, Mm -hmm. um, was really involved in changing laws and making sure that we had an opportunity to at least get a little bit of what was promised to us, which was the education, you know? So um, I lived with them for like six years and... With the couple in... Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and my family was all kind of separated, segregated, and that trauma was never, like, you know, so I lived with them, and then it came to a point where I was just really suicidal, wanted to end my life, and um, was given away. They were my foster family, went to several institutions, went to several group homes. Um, Pretty much, I wasn't going to be any type of contributing member to society by the... Before I was... By the time I was, like, 14, 15 years old. Yeah. And, um, yeah, so went through all of that system and stuff. And then, um, I think, 
Yeah, I mean, so that's kind of where just never feeling like I belonged anywhere to see my family, to mm-hmm. see um, other folks who come here from other countries or other states. Like, there's this like emptiness of like, where do we belong? Where do we create a community that people belong? And that really stemmed from just a really young age of being thrown around to different places and having this life. And I'm not the only one. There's so many other people. And so that's kind of the root of how the Cultural Community and Job Training Center had evolved. Um, But the trainings, you were asking me, well, how did the trainings end up happening? Well, I just realized that what happened to my family was not, it was... It was on the hush hush. Nobody ever talked about it. We just thought, oh, it was this like unfortunate thing that happened to us. Yeah. And it wasn't until I went to college at SPSCC and uh, we were taking this thing about multicultural history and historical slavery and this newer form of slavery that looked very different. And it was called human trafficking. And I was just like, what? And the more I understood it, it was just like this light bulb came on of like, oh my gosh, there is a name to what happened to my family and like what happened to me. And the more I researched and I started speaking out about it in 2008, 2009, Mm -hmm. and um, the more I thought about it, I was like, oh my God, this, this looks so, this looks like this in all these different communities. And like truly vulnerable folks, truly black and brown folks and marginalized folks in our community are at the highest risk of being exploited and being trafficked. So I started talking about it and I started knocking on all the doors for emergency rooms, nurses and doctors. Mm -hmm. I went knocked on for years to all these police departments out here to really understand different cultures, to understand trauma, to see what are the intersections Mm-hmm. of trafficking. It could be mental health. It could be suicide. It could be sexual assault. It could be DV. It could be a lot of things. Mm-hmm. If we know how to have the conversation, know the resources so when people are ready to do something. So it was really around interactive situational trainings. Well, and even for me, like being so involved in homelessness work for so long, it was like Oh, I never even would have thought that a shelter would be a A target, a target for grooming. And like, and I remember, you know, hearing you speak about that and being like, oh, wow, Mm -hmm. we really have to like think about our, even like to the point of people, you know, who could possibly apply to work there or who could come in for volunteerism or whatever. And I mean, and that's like, it's obviously such a different situation what you went through, but just, but there's, there's really all- no difference except for the location. Okay, yeah. I was brought internationally to here, right? So there's that portion. But people right here in our own backyard in Thurston County, um, you know, it's like all the same tactics are used, right? If you're vulnerable, and the way that I say it is like if there are vulnerabilities in people, whether it's self-esteem, whether it's financial, whether it's you're brand new here and you have no community. You're a college student and you have no community out here. Yeah. What makes somebody vulnerable, right? And there's people that are always looking to find the vulnerabilities and to provide opportunities. So like in my family's case, what would that have to do with you, right? With what the work that you do. That grooming process, somebody comes along, knows you're at a shelter, knows that you're vulnerable, knows all these things about you, Right. And they build a trust. They build a relationship. That's what grooming is. Grooming can look a lot of different ways. And you trust them. And then now you're going to go live with them. Or now you're believing that there's opportunity for work. Or this big opportunity to make lots of money to get out of poverty. And those people know that. Yeah. And they use that. So it doesn't matter what background. If we're working with folks that are vulnerable, if we're working with folks who are marginalized, that's what happens. It could be religious where they're mar- marginalized. It could be ethnicity. It could be a lot of things that really put people over here. Yeah. And um, and so anyway, so my story is really not that different in how folks are recruited for sex trafficking or labor trafficking or both, you know. And um, so I really felt passionate about doing that 
type of training for schools, mm -hmm. for nonprofits, for anybody that's a first responder mm -hmm. um, to understand extra resources, but also to be able to ask the right, right question just because you come into seeing a, a suicide situation that could be happening or an overdose or domestic violence, but how do we actually start looking at other things and seeing what, you know? Yeah. So yeah. So that's in a nutshell. No, I mean, I just like, <laughs> I thank know it's you heavy so indeed. much for like, just honestly, like giving that gift to the community of your story. I know that it isn't, I know that it's a complex thing to like have so much of your own personal experiences that mm -hmm. are very real, very painful, yeah. very like recent also in a lot of ways, mm -hmm. like to inform your daily work. And it, it takes a lot of just personal work to be able mm -hmm. to like do that and to continue sharing your story with the community and so well, I, I think just feel like, really just, like blessed right now. Yeah. <laughs> like I mean, I think that, you know, there's two things. I think that the work that you've done in, in continue to do, it's, it's, it's like a mirror for what I'm doing. It's like you experience what it was like to be dehumanized. You experience what it was to feel like you're worthless and how people perceived you and treated you. So you go from like that lowest place of uh, not being a human, right? Yeah. Of being dehumanized. And now you're in this other place of how do we spread kindness? How do yeah. we elevate the human in humanity? And yeah. I feel like that is like our common connection and that is a common message that we're trying to spread in this community. Yeah. Some people get it, some people don't, and that's okay, you know? Yeah. Well, and I think too that for me, so much of my own like healing journey is that I had to find myself as a worthy person. Yes. And like, and I think that that is something that to me is so kind of inspiring about the cultural center that you have is this, like you are centering cultural empowerment and as a, and like providing a space for people to be empowered in their own cultural identities and be celebrated in their own cultural identities. And like, I think it's such a beautiful thing. I don't even have a question around it. I'm just, I just want to hear from you of like, <laughs> is it like, that's part of the vision and that's part of what you're doing there. Yeah. And can you just speak to some of the ways, I guess, that, that, that happens because it's not only about providing healing and hope and awareness to the community, but it's also like within ourselves. I yeah. Think. I mean, one of the things is when we first took it over, the priority was to like, how do we make this place not a happy place, but a place that people can relate to the colors. Mm -hmm. People that want to, they feel like they are welcomed and they feel like they belong. And um, so it's, it, it, and when people walk through the doors, they see the art, they see these messages, these affirmations, or I think that's the word. Mm -hmm. um, like, how can they just relate to some aspect of the center, whether it's color, whether it's art, but also just, show up your full self, mm -hmm. like organically your full self, unapologetically, you know? And I think that that's really hard to do because we're so programmed to wear all these different hats and be all mm -hmm. these different people, right? But when people come in, it's like one of the things is like, this is a no judgment zone. Yeah. This is not where you just say sorry all the time for just being you and existing. Yeah. And to really check, like, why, like I ask my staff and people like, what are you saying you're sorry for? Yeah. Like, it's okay. Like, you did not intentionally set to do something. When you when we're just custom to saying we're sorry, it's almost like, I'm sorry for even being existing. And I want people to feel like you matter no matter where you're at, where you're coming from. In this place, you belong. And you deserve and should be yourself. Yeah. We don't have, we don't, some of the things that we don't do is like, we don't acknowledge different titles and people that are coming in there. You don't need to wear your name badge, what you're doing, unless it's specific for training and you need to. Yeah. Um, but those are things we don't do like VIP events in yeah. this because we're really not trying to do this otherness. We're not trying to do the center where if more people invest in us, support in us, that they're up here versus yeah. a single mom who pays every single month for 20 bucks to because they believe in that place that... So we're really thoughtful in like, how do we not segregate, mm -hmm. you know, and, and have this, like when people want to, like, we want to do a VIP thing for this. It's like, 
well, how come these people are here and just because yeah. somebody has money, do they really have more worth and value? No. Yeah. How can we change that? Can you do it a different day so it's not like visually? Yeah. Visually seeing that the VIP folks are over here and that and the other folks are over here. We're not trying to do those things yeah. that we're so accustomed to, you know. Yeah. Um. So I don't know if that answered your no, question. Yeah, that's so awesome. I mean, what are some of your favorite events that are happening there right now? Like, what's- well, so the cult, so the cultural community and job training center. I mean, we've been there for one year now. Going June will be our second year. We'll be doing our second annual Juneteenth event. Mm-hmm. Um, whenever we do any type of cultural event, it is not some of the guidelines is it is not through the lens of educating and entertaining everybody else. Mm -hmm. It's not just a good time. Let's eat, let's dance and let's listen to some music that can be part of it. Mm -hmm. But the way that we have been culturally celebrating to me is not really deeply understanding who are in our, who, who are the families and people that are in our communities? Yeah. What is their customs and traditions like, you know, is there food? Can we have food at our place that's represented by their community members? And so it's more about like when we're doing Juneteenth, what do our black folks in our community need? Mm-hmm. What are they wanting? You yeah. know, how it's led by them. Yeah. But my only criteria is like this is not, or any group, if it's the Pacifica community gathering, if it's the mm-hmm. Bangladesh community we're not here to try to figure out how to entertain the rest of the world and educate the rest of the world. Right. This is about, it's led by us. What is missing in this community within our communities? Yeah, like a place of belonging for... Yeah, yeah. not just like, wow, we need to get 200 people here yeah. and we need to have this music and we need to have this because this is what the norm is. We should yeah. do a luau and do this and this because this is what we've been doing historically for cultures, and I'm trying to shift that narrative. Yeah, to really think about what's not exploitive and what is liberating and empowering yeah. when we do these events. So we have our second annual Juneteenth event that's going to come up. I loved um, rolling out the cultural bazaar. Really gave an opportunity to folks to sell their goods and products, mm-hmm. um, specifically centering Black and Brown folks. Mm-hmm. Um, young folks, Mm -hmm. our elders, um, to, you know, whatever passion they have. And we keep it really simple. Here's the application fee. Um, not trying to take 30, 40, 50%. That's not my jam. I want people to succeed and Mm -hmm. do well. Um, we've done Pacifica community gatherings. We've done a lot of different equity. Um, the school districts use it. And what I love about our place is that we're neutral. Mm-hmm. You know, so schools have a hard time building relationships with families and are always trying to figure out, especially the marginalized. Well, we have a center. If they're wanting to really build deeper relationships with families that they haven't been able to do for years, and I'm not saying we have some magic answer. There's something about being in that space mm-hmm. that's neutral, yeah. that schools can do stuff. I don't care if it's law enforcement. I don't care what group it is, that it takes people out of what's historically been uncomfortable to build relationships with and to have to start introducing and bringing that for people in our communities marginalized communities to realize like we have relationships with these people so yeah kind of getting off track there but we also will be doing like celebrating sisterhood you know we're gonna have um support groups there we're gonna have conferences we're gonna have dinner and dancing we got the soul cafe that we're trying to get folks to um that is going to make a team there, but we're going to have a culinary and event space job training program, Mm -hmm. again, around folks who have barriers to employment. Yeah. And barriers can mean a lot of different things, but one of the first critical barriers for most people who have barriers to employment is not having a place where they belong. Yeah. Where they are seen, where they are valued, and they're embraced for who they are. That's like the first critical thing of addressing barriers. And then the rest is, you know, the rest is easy. Yeah, yeah. And we've consulted with Fair Start, um, Fair Start and Catalyst Kitchen up in Seattle. Mm-hmm. So we are working on our um, 
consulting with them and, you know, getting our cafe open and things like that and probably be more work with you and a lot of the other yeah. um, nonprofits and businesses that really struggle with, you know, getting employment for folks. Yeah. Will you say for people who don't know, like, where is it exactly and how sure. can people sort of find yeah. out more information? Sure. Um, so the cultural, Asho Cultural Community Center, um, you know, and Asho, I don't think we talked about this, but Asho in Bengali means to, you're calling people to come join you. Mm -hmm. It's a nice way, instead of demanding, it's just come join. And it's been, since 2008, I've kept the same name. Yeah. And it also means for advocating, serving kindness, professionalism, and good food, honoring humanity, you know, whether it's through stories, whether just being in the space, like how do we honor humanity and how we speak and how we show up. Yeah. And then really organizing that collective movement and change. How do we really collectively organize positive change? And so that's our framework for the place. It's yeah. like, are we doing these things? When these events are happening, these people are coming in here. Are we doing it through these lens? Yeah. Um, now I forgot what the question was. How do people find us? So yeah, we, where is it? We, um, I started to really serve... I started cooking from my house during the pandemic, mm -hmm. March 2020. Yep. And I'm telling you, it was hundreds of meals going out of my house. <laughs> and I created this buy one, give one, and pay it forward program. It was in a time when the world shut down, literally shut down. Nobody yeah. was going anywhere. And I'm like, I'm not going to be speaking anywhere. Nobody wants a keynote speaker. Nobody's doing trainings. And my first thought was like, oh, my God, the soup kitchens are closed. Yeah. And I used to be in a lot of those soup kitchen spaces. I was like, how are people going to get food if the shelters are closed or not providing, you know, whatever? So we started this buy one, get one and pay it forward program from my house. And then that was March. And then August of 2020, um, a friend, Daryl, connected me to the Pellegrinos mm -hmm. Catering and Event Center, the owners, Pam and Sam Pellegrino. Mm -hmm. And I, first time I saw the building, first time I stepped in there, I was like, oh, my God, this is my... 13, 14 year dream of having, this is the space. So I shared with them, I'll rent the kitchen for now. When the, when COVID's over, you know, yeah. when COVID's <laughs> over, can I rent the space and do, you know, cultural and conferences and events. And they're like, yeah, your rent, rent will go up more, but sure. And you know, COVID just continued and continued. And so I started serving meals from August of 2020 and up till we've done over, we've donated over 6,500 meals within the community interfaith, yeah. um, Rosie's Place, tent communities, shelters, family support center, anywhere and everywhere that they could use a hot ethnic meal. And then the Pellegrinos left um, 2021 of October. Mm -hmm. And then we took it over a year ago like signed a lease and everything. So um, we're at the former Pellegrino's Catering and Event Center at 5757 Little Rock Road, right across from, on Traspa Road, right across from Costco. Okay. Yeah. And, you know, we don't have like regular hours and things like that because there's always so many different yeah. pieces and we're really trying to be thoughtful about how do we go creating an, a movement in that space mm -hmm. versus transactional. Right, right, right. Like and I not think just that's like renting the space or renting rooms or like really being part of the vision for any events. That yeah, I mean, it, and I think that really it really makes people judge me for my way of doing things over there mm -hmm. because there's this whole entitlement, right? People um, feel like they should just be able to come in and rent the space, which is fine. Right. Like that is part of it. But I think the part that's uncomfortable for some folks is like, I really want to understand what is your outcome? Like, what is, yeah. what is part of this? Is it truly just celebrating and joy? Great. You know, graduation's happening around the corner. Great. But some of the other things, and they could be things that people have been doing in the community and renting a space for a long time. We just ask a little more because is it aligned with what we're doing? Is it bettering our community? Is it strengthening our community and uh, our marginalized folks? Yeah. And I think that's what is really standoffish and it's uncomfortable for people because why should I care? Mm -hmm. They got money. They want to pay for a room. They should just be able to. We just want to make sure it's aligned yeah. and that we're being more thoughtful and being more inclusive. Yeah. 
Yeah, and whenever you do something that's like out of the norm in that way yeah. and ask people for a little bit more, <clears throat> it's like, you know, it can feel, or like, what am I trying to say? I guess it's kind of like <laughs> pushing beyond the performative space yeah. that often we're in. I feel like in mm-hmm. a predominantly white area like yeah. Olympia, that's like really has a strong identity for activism and for, you know, progressive Oh values, yeah. But then, but then when we're ever asked to just like do a little bit yeah. more, it's like yeah. the defensiveness can come in and yeah. I mean, everybody is welcome at our place. Yeah. Everybody is welcome. No matter where you're at with understanding equity or understanding inclusiveness, understanding diversity, wherever you're at, we welcome everybody. And we are really centering that place for black and brown marginalized folks in yeah. our communities. Like we just have not and do not have a center yeah. where we can go and see representation yeah. of people working there, of art, of just, I mean, you know, people are always surprised like how much, how many staff that I've had of color. Like, why is that a shock thing, you know? Yeah. Um, or that you see these young people that are coming in there and they see a reflection of representation of themselves, Yeah, you know? And it just like, like even my son who's 20, I mean, he's just like, mom, I love being in here because I see part of me in here. There's other black men that are portrayed here. He's like, I never see that anywhere. Yeah, I don't see that anywhere. And you're like, yeah, this, this, this is our, this, this is legally my place, but it's our home. Yeah. Yeah. Well, how can, or I guess I'm like, I think the original question is like, how can the community support you more? But I'm like, how, that's like not the question I actually want to ask. I'm like, what, what do you need from the community? Like, what do you want to see from the community? I mean, you've said some of it already a little bit, but I'm just like, how do we go deeper, I guess, in how we show up for. Yeah. I mean, I'm going to give a few tips do's and don'ts and like how to support uh, yeah. a truly black and brown owned business in a cultural community center. Um, one thing I will say is like, if people are wanting to support us um, and you know that we're black and brown owned um, to not tell us that like people don't need to mention that to us. First of all, <laughs> like that like, is oh, just so here awkward to me <laughs> to this day in age. Just to, FYI. Like, yeah, like, <laughs> like, <laughs> You don't call your white friends and say, hey, I want to support you because you are white. You know what I'm saying? Like, that's just so, so like weird to me Yeah. to be told. And it's been like, it's a lot. I get folks that are like, hey, I really want to support a BIPOC business. Good intention, right? Good intention. Yeah. And not everybody identifies that way. Okay. Yeah. That language is not for everybody. It's not inclusive. Um, I know we're trying to in the day and age. That's fine. In our center, we don't. Let's yeah. try to learn to be black and brown and say if it's a certain specific ethnicity, race, or culture, faith. Let's have those conversations. Yeah. Let's not put people in acronyms. You know, I've always had issues with LBGTQIA yeah. acronyms, and now we're doing BIPOC, and now we're doing... Anyways, first thing is, like, just don't tell us. Yeah. Don't tell us that we're colored and that's why you want to support us. Do it because you really want to just support us. And by you showing up to events or by you, you know, investing and supporting us, that tells us enough that you're intentionally trying to support us. Yeah. You don't have to tell us. Yeah. You don't have to tell us. Um, second thing is that, I mean, we are looking for folks who are, Um, wanting to sponsor youth programs, Mm -hmm. want to sponsor support groups. Mm -hmm. We are looking for folks that are looking for ways to contribute their skills and resources to us. There's the financial piece. There's the mentorship piece. You know, we're trying to create a cultural community resource guide. Mm -hmm. And together did a great job. I'm not trying to reinvent the wheel. But I don't know if you've seen those. It's more for youth and families. Mm -hmm. But we're trying to do that more so... Um, where we have relationships. So if somebody's looking for a Nigerian chiropractor, we might have it in our resource guide, yeah, you know? Yeah. Somebody's from 
this particular country and they just moved here and they don't know anybody, they can come to the cultural center and they could be the first one that's a resource for other people who are coming in, you know? Yeah. If there are impactful, empowering events and gatherings and things that they want to do that's going to improve our community morale, our humanity piece, um, like, come and talk to us. Yeah. We are not it for all the programs and services and everything. We need a partnership. Um, and we really want to highlight, like, one of the things that we're working on is, like, we have the cultural bazaar, but how do we build relationships with our nonprofits to build within themselves? Like, mm -hmm. how do our communities really truly know what resources are out there? Yeah. You know, and that we also are a hub to create the missing link or to, to, to create that missing link um, and for communities to actually hear, not because they're in this desperate place and they need a shelter or they need to, you know, something tragic happened, but it's also just like, we should just know the more resources and information we have, the better we're equipped to support when a crisis or a trauma or somebody, you know, has, has been hurt or harmed that an everyday person can just have some of those basic informations because we have them there. Yeah, because it's like we have a more supportive foundation. Yeah. That is not just like reacting to the crises constantly. Yeah. It's like it's ready to actually support. Prevention, them. not yeah. intervention. Yeah. And I know like I'm preaching to the choir telling you this, but one of the things with the space and what we have is like, you know, so when we have the cultural bazaar, we have other nonprofits, direct mm -hmm. service providers um, that are there. They, communities see repeatedly and yeah. some of these are new some of these are older some of these older organizations have new programs that they want to highlight you know yeah. because of after the pandemic and those are people we want like yeah. you know those are the yeah. relationships we want yeah. uh, it's so awesome I'm so happy <laughs> I mean like I'm just so happy for you I know that this has been something that you've been like dreaming of for a really long time and you just like persevered so hard through the pandemic and and it's been a struggle here yeah. trying to get support, yeah. trying to present this dream to people to, um, it just has seemed like it's so far off. And I think it's very, um, when you are very vocal about what, who that center is specifically centering, yeah. um, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's been really difficult and I think the other piece of it is, so we will have a 501c3 status particularly for the education and job training program. Uh -huh. But the, the 75, 80% of the business model is a social purpose corporation. Yeah. Some people know it as a benefit corporation, you know. But people cannot grasp how a for-profit business can even exist to do as much as we give back. Right. And we're like, why can't we be the pathway? Why can't we show that? Yeah. I know there are other amazing organizations, but the culture in this community is like, you have to just be a nonprofit right. to do all the heavy work, to do all the direct service work, yeah. to just be exhausted and, and oftentimes not getting paid enough, you know? And so I'm trying to think of how can we be a for-profit social good organization that really elevates the organizations that are on the ground doing the direct service work. How can we uplift and support and promote you to stay strong and to not work so hard mm -hmm. in your people to be exhausted? How can we create that balance? And for profit, more for profit businesses need to give back and support. Yeah. And it could look a lot of different ways, you know? And so that's, I'm very passionate about that, like just shifting that culture and that narrative. Yeah. Because the nonprofit complex has been driving me nuts and I would love to see more collaboration and connection and just let's let's like elevate together. Yeah. It's really set up in the same oppressive systems as everything else in our country and so then there are these like this like underlying current that even, you know, like to hear you be like, oh, a for-profit business that's like giving back as much. Like sometimes I feel like we are 
a nonprofit trying to work directly against a lot of those oppressive structures yeah. in the nonprofit world. And it's so hard. It is. And so mm -hmm. then you're like on top of the everyday work that you're doing yeah. anyway, just to run yeah. a successful business, just to like run a nonprofit. You're also like up against these like mechanisms yeah. that are specifically designed to be keeping you yeah. from not being able to do it. And and so it's just, I just am so inspired, honestly, by our conversation today. And we were joking before we started that it's just like when we're hanging out on the porch, but now <laughs> I want to just hang out on the porch with you for the rest of the beautiful <laughs> sunny day. But I know that you're such a busy person. And is there anything else that you feel like you're leaving out today that you want the community to hear? I mean, you know, we just, we do the, there's, um, an event that happens um, every first Saturday of the month. And I really like, if you do not know anything about the Cultural Community Center, you are brand new to the community, brand new, uh, or maybe you've been here for a long time um, and you're wanting to find out more about the Cultural Center and the job training program. And um, I always say first Saturday of every month, my best friend, Aaron Jones, does Walk With Aaron. Mm -hmm. And I think you have a flyer with all the dates on there. I don't know if we can see it super well, and but I'll, I'll post links in the... Yeah, and it says, are you new to the community, looking for a way to connect with people? Come learn about the Cultural Community Center and learn how to get involved. And that involved is very broad. It could be mean a lot of different things, you know? Mm -hmm. And that's really, we initially asked people to come just to the first Saturday of the month from 11 to 1. Yeah. Guess what? You get to hang out with the famous Erin Jones. Uh-huh. Um, this coming Saturday, we'll be doing book signing. You get to come and connect organically. You go for a walk, you come back, and we break bread together. Yeah. And then if you feel compelled to invest in the center, if you feel compelled to invest your time into the center, you have some other idea that you're wanting to see happen at the center, we welcome all of that. That is what enriches our cultural community center. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, we do on-site, off-site, full ethnic comfort catering that um, we're very proud of. So it could be Caribbean food, it could be native indigenous cuisine, it could be Indian, Bengali, African, you name it. I can't do all of it, but, <laughs> but I'm pretty comfortable with the selection that we have. Um, and what else? What else? I don't know. Yeah, we do professional speaking and training. We have mm -hmm. professional speakers. We have a lot of focus around, you know, a lot of a lot of our trainers and consultants are close relationships with us. So we're not we're not promoting folks that we don't know. You know, these are folks that are that have been doing anti-racist work or have been doing um, anti-human trafficking or trauma or whatever. Mm -hmm. Some of those really difficult um, topics are. We provide the training there. We can have, we refer consultants and trainers to come out to them. We just want those organizations and spaces to be equipped and liberated in like forward thinking for change. Yeah. So however we can make that happen, you know, we can do it. Somebody wants to get married. Great. You just have great ethnic food. So we yeah. just, you know, yeah, I just say people to come and check us out. That's such a good yeah, and then place to start for folks. So the next yeah. one is this, it's June 4th. Yeah, and then our next, you know, big gathering um, around discussing our history so we can move forward um, is going to be Juneteenth, and mm -hmm. it's going to be on June 19th from 2 to 7. Um, I'm really excited because we just finalized some of this art um, storytelling, and just like, it's just going to be really a moving gathering. Uh, Juneteenth, and then we'll have the cultural bazaar probably starting up. It's going to be all year for Saturday of every month. Okay, okay, awesome. So, once yeah, and so we would love to have Interfaith have a table yeah. there yeah, that'd be of great. resources. You know, it's, it's really not just about showcasing. There may be people who are going through the community like, hey, I want to really be involved and support what Interfaith is doing. Yeah. There might be a vendor that's selling something. We have young people. We have elders. We, I mean, it's a great experience if you yeah. haven't came yet. And Juneteenth will have vendors there as well and resources and different people there. Yeah. So awesome, Krishita. Thank, Thank you, you so much for your time. And everybody, please, I hope that you are feeling as inspired <laughs> as I am by this conversation to, to get involved and show up 
as your I appreciate what self. you do. Yeah. I mean, I really appreciate the work. I've been involved with Interfaith for some time yeah. and I try to show up when I can, you know, and when I can, I can't, you know, yeah. but I appreciate the messages and the work that we're doing together in this community, sister, like yeah, just same. about love, about like everybody has worth and value and, and, and spreading and sharing our abundance and kindness. I mean, I, I feel so honored to be sitting among, you know, among you here because yeah. you've, you've been a pioneer for so much of the work in this community and it's great to, you know, we don't see each other for a while and then it's like we never left the porch, you know? Yeah, so totally. thank you for you and your heart and the passion that you put into this community as well. Like, I just want to tell you, I see you, I hear you and I value the work that you do as well. Thank you, Christina. That means a lot yeah. coming from you. And I feel like we're only going to be able to like grow deeper and deeper together. And yep. I'm There's a lot it. of work to I'm do here for it. Just I know. <laughs> We're like the needles moving. Yeah. We got a lot of needle moving to do together yeah. in this community. And this, this is a really great loving community, you know, and it's going to take work to move the needle even more. Yeah. But I think this kind of collaboration, these kinds of hard conversations and loving conversations, it's at least the entry into beautiful change that is going to, that we're going to see in this community. Yeah, totally. Yeah. What a perfect way <laughs> to end it today. Um, we will have this episode as always up on YouTube, um, on our Facebook and on our website. And then find us on Spotify. Usually in about a week or so, we'll have the episode up there. Um, Krishita, thank you. Thank you, Ray. Really means a lot to spend this time with you today. And we say, you know, salam alaikum and may peace be upon you and everybody that's watching the show today. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. All right. See y'all later. Bye.